Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Hope you had a great Thursday and Friday over break. Uh, so welcome back to class. We're going to pick up in chapter 11. So before break, we finished through chapter 10. Um, so the last two chapters we have to cover are from you know gases in chapter 10. We're going to talk about liquids here in chapter 11. And then um, our final chapter is only going to be probably about like half a section of the chapter. So we're briefly going to talk about chapter 12 on solids. Um, going to mainly just describe some different properties of a couple different categories of solids. And then we'll be into uh, reviewing for the final. We'll probably get through chapter 11 um, probably Wednesday, if not maybe a little bit into Friday's lecture. We will probably wrap up chapters 11 and 12 by the end of the week and be able to spend next Monday and Wednesday uh, reviewing content for the final exam. I was intending to look up when the final is. I think it's Monday of finals week, if I recall. I'm seeing a couple head shakes. So I think it's Monday of finals week. So we have uh, all of next week through the weekend to prepare for the final. It's a cumulative exam, so we have to make sure to review chapters 1 through 9 in addition to um, chapters 10 and 11, and like I said, a little bit of, out of chapter 12. Uh, the exam's not incredibly heavy on the new material, so we're going to cover chapters 10, 11, and that little bit of 12 with about the same amount of coverage as we do chapters 1 through 9. So you're going to see about five questions per chapter. That little bit of chapter 12, I think, results in one question on the final. So you're going to see probably about four to six questions from chapters uh, 10 and 11, and probably about four to six questions from chapters 1 through uh, 9 as well on the final. You get a little bit more time. There's two hours for the final. It's like an hour and 45, I think, to be precise, but um, or an hour and 40, I think. So it's a little bit longer than the midterms. So there's um, approximately 50 questions on the final. Um, so hopefully we'll be well prepared, though. So um, we'll talk about more review stuff as we get into next week. OK, so on to chapter 11 on liquids. So we're going to talk about liquids and intermolecular forces. Um, the intermolecular forces that we're getting into for real liquids that were being described by the A constant in the Van der Waals equation. The intermolecular forces are what's holding liquids together. And then also, um, those are the forces that hold um, uh, molecules together in their solid form as well. We'll talk about a molecular comparison between gases, liquids, and solids. Um, talk about the intermolecular forces, what different types of forces there are, and how we can describe some different properties of liquids using those intermolecular forces. Uh, we'll talk about heat changes associated with phase uh, changes. So as you go from solid liquid to gas, you can uh, understand that heat has to be absorbed by the solid to uh, ultimately vaporize into its gaseous form. And we can calculate the heat associated with those transitions or understand or, or see how they're related to things like specific heat and then the enthalpies of phase changes. And then we'll talk about vapor pressures and phase diagrams to wrap up the chapter. Okay, so. Um, let's look at uh, a couple different elements. So chlorine, bromine, and iodine give us a good comparison between um, substances that exist in their elemental form at room temperature as a gas, that's chlorine. Um, bromine is a liquid at room temperature. It's one of two liquid elements at room temperature, mercury being the other. And so uh, bromine also exists as a diatomic molecule, Br2, but it exists as a liquid as its most common state at room temperature. And then iodine, I2, exists in solid form at room temperature. The, you know, if you, the, the really generic explanation on why these substances exist as gases, liquids, or solids has all to do with their melting points and boiling points, of course. So the boiling point of chlorine would be below room temperature. The boiling point of uh, bromine would be above room temperature. The melting point of I2 would be above room temperature. And so you can just get a sense that, okay, their melting points are changing and boiling points are changing. That's why one exists as a gas versus liquid versus solid at room temperature. Um, and so then another thing I always find to be funny is that um, silly 21 Pilot song, Sipping on Straight Chlorine. Why wouldn't he have just said bromine? <laughs> like, because bromine's a liquid. How can you drink a gas? And he's quite clear that it's straight chlorine. So, um, so I just want to remember it's bromine that's liquid, not chlorine. I don't know how you're drinking a gas. But um, Br2 is a liquid, I2 is a solid. Now, one of the comparisons of these compounds would be that the force that's you know, linking up the I2 compounds must be stronger. So I2 must have the stronger intermolecular force. That's why it's going to be held together in the solid form. So of the three, it has the strongest intermolecular force. And then Cl2 would have the weakest intermolecular force. It has a weaker force, not held together as strongly, easier to break those forces of attraction. 
And so as soon as you start thinking boiling points, melting points, you can get a clear link that, that as the intermolecular forces become stronger, then the boiling point's going to become stronger or become higher. So higher boiling points when molecules are held together with a stronger force because that force has to be overcome by the temperature that we're increasing to with that increased boiling point. And so another factor that can increase the strength of intermolecular forces, now, now if we're looking at Cl2, Br2, I2, I2 is bigger, so you might be looking on one hand and saying bigger is better. In a way, it is in terms of the force that exists between molecules like Cl2, Br2, and I2, which we're going to define in a couple slides from now, but this is going to be what we call a dispersion force. A dispersion force is a force that exists um, or it's the only force that can exist between nonpolar molecules. So nonpolar molecules or things like noble gases, gaseous substances like helium, neon, argon, the only force that can exist is what we call a dispersion force. We'll see a slide on this that'll maybe show a better picture of this, but it's like an induced dipole. It's where the two molecules adjacent to each other would somehow push their electrons in such a way where they create a plus and a minus side. Like if we're looking at I2, for example, two iodines next to each other don't have any special attractive forces relative to each other because if you recall, they have formal charges and actual charges of zero. So from the Lewis structures, we would have had this type of Lewis structure for both of the molecules. And so from the Lewis structure, you get formal charges of zero. From oxidation numbers, they have oxidation numbers of zero. Neither atom can be plus or minus because they both have to have the same charge. The only way to have the same charge for an uncharged molecule is to have charges of zero. And so these two molecules adjacent to each other have no built-in, if you will, attractive force. There's no plus and minus that's going to give them an electrostatic um, charge that electrostatically links the molecules. Well, what if the electrons push themselves around in such a way that you end up polarizing the, the molecule to be partial negative, partial positive. Well, that's a dispersive force, where the molecules are gonna kinda like pair up their electrons in such a way to create a partial positive and a partial negative side. And so if we do that, this is the dispersion force. So this attractive force here is the dispersion force. And so the ability to induce that dipole moment, to, to induce this dispersion is stronger the more spread out those electrons are. So the more dispersed the electrons are, the bigger the molecule, the easier it's going to be for it to sort of push these electrons around. And so the dispersion force is directly proportional to the you know, size of the molecule. So the bigger the molecule, the more dispersed the electrons are, the better. And we're gonna see a lot of examples of this that look at you know, having you know, a relatively small but heavy atom versus having a relatively large but two atom molecule like I2 versus having a lot of atoms in something like decane or something where we have a long chain hydrocarbon. So we're gonna compare that in a little bit where we can look at size in a few different ways, but if you look at Cl2, Br2, I2, they're the same kind of basic structure of two atoms, greater mass for iodine, greater size, gives it that greater dispersion force. Stronger attractive force means more temperature required to break those attractive forces, so higher melting point, higher boiling point. Now, some molecules have a built-in charge already, like HCl. HCl already has this partial negative and partial positive because it's a polar molecule. So the polar molecule doesn't need to um, disperse its electrons to have an attractive force. So it has a stronger attractive force because it already has these charges built in. So we have what we call it's still a weak intermolecular force if you compare this to like ionic attraction. If you compare this to like K plus Cl minus, that's a really strong attractive force between the plus one and minus one charged ions. Um, the electrostatic force of attraction between polar molecules isn't, isn't large, but it is going to be a stronger force than comparably sized nonpolar molecules. So if you're looking at attractive forces, it's, you're gonna have a stronger force between polar molecules of comparable size than you will nonpolar molecules. So weak intermolecular force, but stronger than you would expect for a nonpolar molecule. This is what we call our dipole-dipole force. Now, if you go back to um, lattice energy, if you recall, lattice energies were strongest when ions were smallest because the ions were getting closer together.
the closer together, remember kappa Q1, Q2 divide by D, the closer together we make our charges, the stronger the force. And so our dipole-dipole force, these are actually going to be stronger with smaller um, atoms. So these are going to be stronger as we go to smaller size. You think of having the smallest possible atom with the greatest possible charges are going to be where you get the strongest dipole-dipole force. And when we get to those molecules, we're going to actually identify and call those a special type of force we call a hydrogen bond. You may have heard of these before. We'll define it on the slide. But things like water benefit from this dipole-dipole force being especially strong because water is polar, and then water has a relatively small oxygen and hydrogen that develop relatively high partial positive and negative charges that give it an especially strong attractive force. So let's go through and compare some different types of molecules and some different attractive forces. And so this slide here is comparing um, you know, things like ionic bonds, lithium fluoride, really strong attractive force because we have a full plus, full minus, really small ions as well. Our melting points over 1100 uh, Kelvin, over 1900 Kelvin for the boiling point uh, for lithium fluoride. So really strong. This is what we mean by a strong attractive force uh, between the plus and minus charged ions and lithium fluoride. If we want to melt or boil a substance, we have to break those attractive forces. We have to break some of them to melt. We have to break all, if we want to boil the substance, we have to somehow separate all these ions um, into their gaseous form. And so if we also look at metals, you're going to see metals have a strong attractive force too. Now you may not think of something like iron solid or sodium solid. You may not think that those substances have bonds. Sometimes it's a, you know, a trick question if we said, does Fe solid have bonds? Sometimes you want to say, well, it's just one atom. How can it have a bond? But it's in solid form. All the atoms are connected together. We don't talk a lot about metallic bonding. We'll talk a little bit more in chapter 12, but very briefly we'll talk about this bonding. But metallic bonds do, of course, exist in solid forms of metallic elements, and they can be really strong. Where we have really high melting points and boiling points for something like beryllium, we know um, iron as well has a really high melting point and boiling point. Um, and that's because we have this strong metallic bond. Um, the metallic bond is metal atoms next to each other kind of all sharing their electrons. We're going to see a picture of that in chapter 12. But a really strong attractive force exists between uh, metals and their solid form. We even have um, what we call like a covalent network structure in something like diamond or graphite. So if you look at diamond, what diamond is, it's where you imagine having something like methane, but where you put a carbon at each vertice and then you do it again. And so you just imagine having carbon at every piece of your vertice, you end up having like a hexagonal sheet in three dimensions of, uh, of interconnected carbon atoms. So you have covalent networks like in all three dimensions in one structure. So it's almost like you have one huge molecule of your crystal of something like a diamond. So diamonds have incredibly high melting points and boiling points, really strong structures. So if you compare methane with diamond, diamond has all of the covalent bonds interlinked in the whole structure. Methane has one molecule, another molecule, another molecule where they're not cross-linked. So you get all this basic cross-linking, if you want to think of it that way, within the covalent network solids. That's why they have their really high melting points and boiling points. But then you get into the relatively weaker intermolecular forces. These are the forces that are gener generally holding together our molecular compounds. So if you think of a molecular compound, it's a substance that contains non-metallic elements. We're not metal, non-metal. Ionic compounds, really high melting points and boiling points. But if we're on the molecular side, the only thing that can hold molecules together are these weaker intermolecular forces, things like those dispersion forces holding N2 together. Nitrogen, therefore, is going to have a really low um, boiling point and melting point because it has the weakest of the intermolecular forces, and it's also relatively small. Um, so if you look at the melting point and boiling point of uh, nitrogen, 77 Kelvin, um, really low uh, uh, boiling point for nitrogen due to that really weak intermolecular force. If you look at the weakest, and I think there's a slide in this later, like helium has the lowest melting point, I think, of any substance known, where its uh, boiling point is 4 Kelvin. So just 4 degrees above absolute zero is its, um, excuse me, that's its boiling point, and its um, melting point is like 1 or 2 Kelvin. So really low uh, melting point for something like helium because it's really small, and it has no built-in attractive force with itself. 
And so it has a really low ability to cause that dispersion force to exist in itself. You know? So if, if you have something like nitrogen, the nitrogen molecules adjacent to each other have to somehow become polarized in order for the nitrogen molecules to be attracted together. That's what leads it to have such a low melting point and boiling point. Hydrogen chloride, where HCl, like again, like we may look at this as hydro, uh, hydrochloric acid. If you throw this into water, it's hydrochloric acid. But if you have it, say, in a gas cylinder, in its gaseous form, it's just HCl with a bond, lone pairs around the chlorine. It, it's a gas at room temperature because the boiling point is lower than 298 Kelvin. So the boiling point, 188 Kelvin. So we get a stronger attractive force. HCl's comparable in molecular weight. It's like molecular weight's about 36 AMU. Nitrogen's 28 AMU. And you can see having that built-in attractive force allowed it to have a higher melting point and boiling point due to having that stronger but still weak dipole-dipole force of attraction. And so for dispersion forces, if you make the molecule bigger, like I2, much bigger than N2, ends up having a melting point above room temperature. If you then said, well, what if we make HCl smaller? If it were only a dispersion force, you would imagine HF would have had a lower melting point and boiling point, but its melting point and boiling point increase compared to HCl. And that's because we've now increased the dipole difference. We increased the electronegativity difference between the atoms. We've increased the partial charges. So you think about the charges, the partial negative and the partial positive charges are higher on HF. We calculated them in chapter nine or chapter eight, I think it was. They were like 0.4 units of an electron. If we did it for HCl, I think it's like 0.27 units of an electron. So higher set of charges, more polarized bond, and fluorine's also smaller, so those charges are closer together. So the H and the F can get closer together. And that gives this a much higher attractive force, but still weaker overall. It doesn't get anywhere near lithium fluoride's strength of attraction. So if we were comparing um, HF to lithium fluoride, where you're saying, well, what does it mean to be you know, partially charged versus fully charged? It makes a big difference, right? It makes a big difference between having a melting point of 190 Kelvin versus 1100 Kelvin for lithium fluoride. And so then if you also look at the um, boiling point, 293 Kelvin, a lot higher than HF, so a strong attractive force, stronger attractive force between HCl, but still overall pretty weak when you compare it to the ionic bond. And so this attractive force here is actually the type that we call a hydrogen bond. So we call it a hydrogen bond because it's an especially strong dipole-dipole force of attraction. And we're going to see that that is the attractive force when H is directly bonded to NO or F. We'll define that on the later slide, but just to kind of lay the ground for that, that whenever we have a hydrogen atom directly bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, then we're going to get this especially strong hydrogen bonding force of attraction. That if we have hydrogen bonded to other elements that are polar, that we're not going to have as strong of an attractive force as we might expect between those types of molecules. And we'll see some examples of those. So this picture here is trying to show um, kind of at the um, electron level what it looks like to cause a dispersion force. So in our first example, we have two helium atoms with no particular polarization, meaning the electrons in two atoms that are next to each other are just completely randomly oriented in the molecule. Um, then we can start to instantaneously have the electrons start to coordinate their motions together to try to become polarized. And then at some point, if we can get the electrons to be on the same side of the respective atoms, then we kind of create a negative side and a positive side of our atom. And we've come up with this relatively weak but then existing um, charge that can exist between the two helium atoms that allows them to have some attractive force. It was a long, for a long time thought that helium would never actually liquefy. That helium, because it's a noble gas, so small, that there's just no way you could get two helium atoms to even stick together, let alone a collection of helium atoms in liquid form. But it turns out, like if you go to below 4 Kelvin, in fact, you can buy liquid helium where you have an entire sample of helium um, at a temperature less than 4 Kelvin. And so at 4 Kelvin, you can get the helium atoms to coordinate their electrons on the same side to induce this dipole moment. So this is the dispersion force, the induced dipole force on helium. 
So four Kelvin is our boiling point. Just to kind of show, just four degrees above absolute, absolute zero, um, helium then uh, would gasify, would vaporize, and then not be a liquid anymore. So if we compare um, some dispersion forces for something like a noble gas, um, neon versus F2, and um, we can see that neon, really low boiling point F2, having two atoms, um, also being bigger as a result, gives it a higher boiling point. If we compare argon, now argon has a molar mass of about 40 AMU versus chlorine, which has a molar mass of 70 AMU and two atoms to disperse those electrons, that chlorine has a much higher melting point compared to um, uh, Cl2, much higher than argon. If you compare neon to argon, argon becomes higher because argon's bigger. So as we increase the size of our noble gas to krypton to xenon, we're increasing the boiling point. So increasing the size, so our dispersion force directly proportional to size. So as you have a stronger uh, dispersion force, you're going to get a stronger dispersion force for a larger atom or a larger molecule. So if you go from F2 to Cl2, you increase the boiling point. As you go to Br2, you see we go above room temperature for the boiling point, so now we have a liquid. And then look at I2 all the way up at 458 Kelvin, a uh, couple hundred degrees C uh, boiling point. Um, so there's our, our solid at room temperature. Now if you look at the noble gases, they're not increasing by much. They're still gases. Um, even radon, uh, the largest natural occurring uh, noble gas, is still a gas at room temperature. That's why we call them noble gases, of course. And so then if you're also comparing relatively similar size, like Krypton's molar mass is about 83 versus Cl2 at 70, do you see how it's better to have two atoms to disperse the electrons than one atom? So by having two atoms, you're just creating, instead of having Krypton with all its electrons centered around one atom, chlorine, we can disperse those electrons around two atoms, and it creates like a larger volume that those electrons are occupying. So if you think, so having one sphere versus two spheres, two spheres is better. So we get a bigger size. So as the number of atoms increase, the size increase. So the, like the number of atoms is directly proportional to size. So the more atoms you have to disperse the same amount of mass, the bigger the size that the molecule has, the easier it's going to be to disperse those electrons. If we could have 70 AMU, but with the most atoms, if we have three atoms to disperse that force, then we would predict a higher uh, boiling point. If we had four atoms, even higher. And we'll see a few more comparisons that really looks at how atoms can help disperse those electrons. We can compare like a linear versus a branch compound too. So if you look at n-pentane, that's just meaning we have all of our carbon atoms connected in a linear sequence. So n-pentane, of course, would just be the structure of CH3, CH2, 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 CH3. And that has a boiling point of 309 Kelvin. If you imagine taking the same count of carbon and hydrogen atoms, we have a central carbon, and then we connect CH3s to a central carbon. So it kind of looks like methane, but instead of hydrogens hanging off the carbon, we have CH3 groups. And so this here still has the same formula, C5H12, but then it's not as branch of a structure. And so then if you're thinking, I have two um, structures of pentane that can get, you know, so if you imagine it's the ability of the electrons to induce their motions together, probably gonna be easier for the straight chain molecule to induce a dipole moment in itself, because you have all this connective uh, ability of the molecules to get together to disperse their electrons versus having two spheres where our contact point's smaller. So less contact probably means a harder ability to disperse those electrons results in a lower boiling point. So a straight chain allows for a stronger intermolecular force. And then the branch structure leads to a weaker intermolecular force. So it's better to have more atoms with the same size. It's better to have a straight chain molecule as opposed to a branch compound as well. So more atoms and then straighter chains are better for stronger intermolecular forces.
So let's look at some dipole-dipole forces. Um, so here is looking at a molecule of CH3CN. If we're, you know, one of the things that is a little bit helpful to remember is just being able to predict polarity. You know, so like if we're looking at things that we've seen before, you know, like the n-pentane, the um, neopentane in the previous slide, carbon-hydrogen bonds not very polarized, and all those bonds are opposing each other anyways. So we don't have very polar compounds on the previous slide. If we think of, you know, Cl2, I2, you know, things like argon, these are all nonpolar, meaning they don't have any built-in charges. So those are nonpolar, so we don't have a dipole-dipole force. The only force of attraction between those molecules <clears throat> is a dispersion force. But then if we can look at a molecule and predict if it's polar or nonpolar, we can then get a sense if it should have a dipole-dipole force of attraction. So this molecule here has carbon, nitrogen. Nitrogen is one of the more electronegative atoms. We get a polarized bond. We're going to have a partial positive, partial negative. We have a negative side of our molecule. We're going to have a more positive end of our molecule over here. We definitely have a polar molecule. So spotting polarity is usually spotting a molecule that contains things like NOF, Cl, maybe sulfur, bromine as well. You have a relatively electronegative element paired up with something that's not electronegative or something that's not itself. And then also the bonds are situated in such a way we get this built-in polarity. Um, there was a question on the midterm I just wanted to, to bring up, which is this one here. Of, is this molecule here polar or nonpolar? This is a Lewis structure, of course. So when I sketch a Lewis structure, I have to interpret the three-dimensional molecular shape, which would be this here. So I have to think of the tetrahedral shape of the molecule, and the molecule is certainly going to be polar. If we think it's nonpolar, it's because we're probably thinking the molecule actually has 90 degree bond angles where it doesn't. If you think this is a structure here, we could have put the chlorine here, the hydrogen here, and we would have predicted the molecules polar in that geometry. But the key is you have to not think of the Lewis structure, but the actual shape of the molecule to predict polarity. So just if we're predicting polarity, go back to molecular shape. For molecular shape, you know, you need different atoms. Like you would want the same atom in every spot of the tetrahedron for the molecule to be nonpolar. If we had CCL4 nonpolar, but we replace one of those chlorines with anything but a chlorine, you get a polar molecule. So CH2, Cl2, definitely polar. And so for these polar molecules, they would have this dipole-dipole force of attraction. So the dipole-dipole force is just the dipoles kind of uniting and pairing up. In a solid form, they're going to pair up and stick together. But the molecules, when they're in solid form, aren't frozen. They're still moving around, just not as much. In the liquid form, they're tumbling around. But while the molecules are tumbling in the liquid phase, they're still experiencing the intermolecular force, just not as strongly as they would in the solid form. So if you think of a solid melting, it has to break some of those intermolecular forces. If we want to vaporize a substance, we have to break all the intermolecular forces. So intermolecular forces are related to melting point trends and boiling point trends. So we're going to get a stronger attractive force. So if you compare, um, this molecule is called acetonitrile, CH3CN. If you compare CH3CN to something of comparable size but it's nonpolar, the nonpolar molecule is going to have a weaker attraction, lower melting point, lower boiling point. So what this slide here is comparing is kind of doing that trend here where we look at acetonitrile. Uh, molecular weight's about 41 AMU. If you compare that to propane, which is about 40 AMU, it's about 44 AMU, so slightly bigger, but nonpolar. Being nonpolar, you can see, reduces its boiling point by quite a lot, over 100 degree C. Its boiling point's 231 Kelvin, gas at room temperature, uh, much different set of properties than you get for acetonitrile, which is now a liquid at room temperature and is uh, useful then as being like an organic solvent since it's a liquid at room temperature. If we then compare to something like um, dimethyl ether, which has a molecular weight comparable in that same range as well, 46 AMU, the difference between um, dimethyl ether versus propane is we put an oxygen atom in the center of the molecule. So we have CH3, O, CH3. In terms of a Lewis structure, we'd have our CH3, O, CH3. Again, you have to be careful. The real structure here is not linear about the, the COC bond here. This isn't linear. This is closer to 109.5 degrees for tetrahedral because we have four domains on that oxygen atom. We have two electron pairs. And so we definitely have a bent bond here. 
And so the molecule should certainly be polar. Now, I don't know if you could predict, like if I said, is dimethyl ether more polar or less polar than acetonitrile, I don't think I would expect you to predict this just from looking at the two molecules. But if I told you they're dipole moments, where dipole moment is in some ways a measure of the, the polarity of the molecule. It's not a perfect um, mimic of polarity, but in some ways it measures the polarity um, as the dipole moment becomes higher, the molecule becomes more polar. And so acetonitrile is more polar, um, so it has a higher dipole moment. And then a weaker dipole moment, lower dipole moment, less polar for dimethyl ether gives it still a higher dipole moment than a nonpolar molecule, but not as high as acetonitrile. So if we increase the polarity a little more, we go to a molecule called acetaldehyde, which has, a, again, a comparable molecular weight. When we're comparing polar versus nonpolar, we've got to be careful to compare molecules of similar size, because if we just made propane larger, then it's going to pick up a stronger uh, dispersion force. So we have to um, compare comparably sized molecules, acetal, uh, acetaldehyde, CH3, C, double bond to O, to H. Here is our structure, lone pairs on the oxygen. Certainly a polar molecule. Its polarity is right in between that of uh, dimethyl ether and acetonitrile, and it has a higher boiling point, but not as high as acetonitrile. So as we increase polarity, we're increasing the strength of that dipole-dipole force of attraction. And as we increase the dipole-dipole force of attraction, we increase the boiling point. So higher boiling points for stronger dipole-dipole forces of attraction. Now let's talk about the hydrogen bond. So as, you know, if we maybe kind of leave out the molecules NH3, HF and, and water for a minute. Let's like not talk about those just yet. Let's look at CH4 to SiH4 to germanium H4 to tin H4. Here we have tetrahedral molecules. So we have CH4 and then silicon's the same structure of tetrahedral. So in each of these cases here, we have a nonpolar molecule. And if we increase the size of the central atom, we're making the, the structure bigger, the size bigger. Make the size bigger, you, you increase the dispersion force. So this whole trend here is just looking at the strengths of increased dispersion force, which increases with the size of that central atom. And the only force of attraction present in those molecules is the dispersion force, because they're not polar. If we look at these molecules here, if you compare, say, H2S to H2 selenium, we have a little bit of a tricky comparison because H2S is more polar, so like the, the HS bond is going to be more polar. Selenium is not as much a negative as sulfur, so the difference isn't as high. So we have a less polar bond for H2SC, but it's bigger. So you get a stronger dispersion force. And so what we see for this structure here is that you get the increase, again, because you get an increased dispersion force. And it's an interesting kind of um, uh, thing to clue us into the fact that all molecules have dispersion forces. Like even if a molecule has a stronger force of attraction, which we'll call like a hydrogen bond, or even molecules with a dipole-dipole force, they still have a dispersion force. And if you make the central atom bigger, you increase that dispersion force. And so all molecules have the dispersion force. And I just want to say, like, even polar molecules, you know, just so that we're, when we identify a polar molecule that has a stronger dipole-dipole force of attraction, that the molecule can still induce a dipole moment in itself. And it does benefit from whatever the size of the molecule is to induce a dipole moment to be even bigger than the built-in charges that the molecule has. Um, You'll see this as well if you have, like, if you go back to acetaldehyde, if you make the, the, the chain longer, if you go CH3, CH2 with the C double bond O group, like, if you compare having a longer chain and then you have that double bond O group, that what you do is you increase the dispersion force with a longer chain, you end up having a higher boiling point. So this has a higher boiling point than CH3. C double bond OH. So 
again, we can still picture dispersion forces with molecules that are uh, polar where we're looking at the dipole-dipole force. So all molecules have a dispersion force. If you have a bigger molecule that's polar, um, then it's going to have a stronger dipole-dipole force. And that's what we see here in the middle is that H2S, H2 selenium, or if you have the H3 phosphorus to the uh, H3, uh, whatever the atom of arsenic is, that you're increasing the dispersion force, increasing the boiling point as a result. Well, let's look at the comparison between then our water, NH3, and HF. Because for them, you may think, well, they have the weakest dispersion force because they're the smallest, yet you can see they have the highest boiling points for their respective trends and their rows in the periodic table. And this is because two things happen. One, they have an even higher dipole-dipole force, but we make those atoms really small. So this is that um, small um, uh, sort of picture coming in from lattice energy where being smaller with charges is better. And so water is actually even better than fluorine in this regard because it has two hydrogen bonds. So when you look at uh, water, water can form hydrogen bond with one of its hydrogens or with the other. So we have two hydrogen bonding sites on water. Um, on HF, we only have one hydrogen bond site. Fluorine is the most electronegative atom, so you can imagine this one bond is probably stronger than one of the bonds in water, but water gets two. So water has the ability to form two hydrogen bonds, which gives it a higher melting point compared to HF. Now, NH3 kind of suffers in a way because you may say, well, it could have three hydrogen bonds because it has three hydrogens attached to an N, but the electronegativity of N is so low that each of those bonds is just too weak for it to have the strongest attractive force of the three. And so if you look at NH3, it has actually a boiling point well below room temperature, so it's not even a liquid at room temperature like water is. HF uh, boils just above room temperature as a gas, or excuse me, HF is a pure substance. So if you have HF with no water, that it has the boiling point just above room temperature. If you ever encounter HF, which I hope you don't because it's a nasty compound, we've talked about it before, um, it can eat through your flesh, it's incredibly toxic, uh, incredibly deadly, uh, but if you, you usually work with it dissolved in water, kind of like you do HCl. So whenever we work with hydrogen chloride, we usually dissolve it in water, call it hydrochloric acid then, usually use HF in water, call it hydrofluoric acid, but in their pure forms, pure HF has a boiling point just below room temperature, water of course, um, 100 degrees C. And so water's really benefiting here from having a strong uh, intermolecular force of attraction we call the hydrogen bond. It's benefiting from having two of these hydrogen bonds per molecule, and then it's getting the strong hydrogen bonding force because oxygen small, hydrogen small, high charges on them, relatively speaking, for polar molecules, and we get this strong attractive force. You can see it's off the scales. Now, if you look at sulfur, if you look at chlorine, you could say sulfur and chlorine are pretty electronegative too, but you can see that the sulfur, H2S, and then if you look at the HCl, they're not even off the chart. They're not even higher than the next bigger member in their periodic table. If you compare HBr, HBr has a higher melting point and boiling point than HCl. So HCl is not incredibly high in any regard. HF is. So HF benefits by having this hydrogen bonding force of attraction. HCl doesn't have any especially strong dipole-dipole force. It's not even higher in terms of boiling point than HBr. Same thing with sulfur. It's not higher than H2 selenium. So there's nothing really special going on with H2S. We just have a dipole-dipole force for those molecules. And for water, HF, and H3, these are the ones that form that H bond. So the hydrogen bonding force of attraction is when we have H directly bonded to NO or F, we get this especially strong dipole-dipole uh, force that we call the hydrogen bonding force. So H has to be directly bonded by a covalent bond to N, O, or F. The smallest atoms with the highest electronegativities, giving us the greatest um, partial positive and negative charges on those atoms. Because fluorine only forms one bond, like fluorine doesn't form bonds with two different atoms, the only hydrogen bonding example of fluorine is HF. With water, you can replace one of the hydrogens with like uh, a CH3 group or some other type of group. So with the, um, you have like things like um, 
uh, methanol, ethanol, the alcohols form hydrogen bonding force of attractions because we still have hydrogen directly bonded to oxygen. And then we have a lot of derivatives of the NH3 compounds where you can replace a hydrogen with a CH3 group or some other type of group. So with nitrogen, you can get some other examples other than just NH3 that hydrogen bond. But with fluorine, this is the only example is HF for a hydrogen bonding uh, molecule that forms hydrogen bonds. Okay, so let's think here, which molecule can exhibit the hydrogen bonding intermolecular force of attraction? So we just have to remember the hydrogen bonding intermolecular force is that force between molecules. It's that force between like the water. So we have water, it's this attractive force here is the hydrogen bond. The hydrogen bond isn't the hydrogen atom covalent bonded to something. Like if I look at water, this is a covalent bond And then if I look at this bond over to here, this is the H bonding. So that's the hydrogen bonding intermolecular force. Just so that we're clear that the hydrogen bond is specifically between adjacent molecules where H is directly bonded to NO or F. So when we look at the molecules that can exhibit the hydrogen bonding force of attraction, CH3F doesn't fit the bill. It has fluorine. But if you look at the structure, the hydrogen atoms are attached to carbon. We want hydrogen directly attached to fluorine, not to the carbons. So we get no hydrogen bonding force of attraction on CH3F. So the only example of fluorine, again, is HF. Because we want the hydrogen directly bonded to NO or F. And then it's the adjacent force on another HF molecule that's the hydrogen bonding force of attraction. So this attractive force here is our H bond, not the actual hydrogen bonding force within the molecule. These attractive forces here, this is just a covalent bond. So covalent bonds are different than intermolecular forces of attraction. Intermolecular forces of attraction are weaker forces compared to covalent bonds, but they're still important. They help the molecule stick together in its liquid phase. We have um, ethanol, which is the classic case. We have hydrogen directly attached to oxygen. So if we have an adjacent molecule, we can have the hydrogen attracted to the oxygen of um, ethanol. So this is our H bonding force of attraction here. And so ethanol can form this force of attraction, but um, dimethyl ether cannot. Again, we need hydrogen directly bonded through a covalent bond to NO or F. We don't get that for CH3O, CH3. And so if you remember, dimethyl ether, relatively low melting point, bo the boiling point was well below room temperature still. Um, the boiling point of ethanol is a little bit below 100 degrees C. It's pretty close to that of water. And so ethanol has a pretty high boiling point due to the strong intermolecular force of attraction. So only ethanol can form that intermolecular hydrogen bonding force of attraction. But the key, sometimes the confusing key is sometimes we see hydrogen bonding. Which molecule forms the hydrogen bonding force? Sometimes we just look at things that have hydrogen bonds. This is a hydrogen covalent bond, not the hydrogen bonding intermolecular force of attraction. So we also get forces between ions and dipoles. This is why things like NaCl ultimately dissolved in water, is because NaCl, which has the strong electrostatic force of attraction, the high lattice energy, so we know plus and minus charges have a strong attractive force for each other, but the plus and minus charges also have a strong attractive force with solvents like water. And so the chlorine can be attracted to the positive end of water, the sodium can be attracted to the negative end of water, the oxygen atom, and then we get what we call the ion dipole force of attraction. And the ion dipole force of attraction are going to be directly proportional to the magnitudes of charge, just like you would expect for any type of charge interaction. If you imagine having calcium chloride the calcium chloride has a stronger intermolecular charge between the two plus calcium compared to the plus one sodium. Um, but so too do the charges in the original compound. If you're looking at the lattice energy, that you get a stronger attractive force in the original compound as well. You'll look in chapter 13 when you start chem 1220 on why some compounds dissolve in water and others don't. You'll look at um, the, the sort of um, lattice energy versus the solvation energy. It becomes a kind of comparison to give and a take of how much attractive force did you have in the plus minus in the solid versus how much you're replacing with the ion dipole force with water or some type of solvent. 
Um, and so for NaCl, we can probably predict that you get a stronger attractive force between the water than you did originally between the plus and the minus ions. That's why it dissolves in water. And then it's also directly proportional to the inverse of the size of the ions. Of course, the smaller ions, stronger attractive force for the same idea. Anytime you have charge being dispersed and you have an attractive force, electrostatics, smaller charges of the same charge have a stronger attractive force. So smaller sized ions, um, stronger forces of attraction, but they also start with stronger forces of attraction in their solid lattices too. So it doesn't necessarily help you predict which compounds dissolve in water or not. If you go back to the solubility, solubility trends from chapter four, uh, it kind of becomes a give and a take on the strength of the lattice energy versus the strength of the intermolecular attraction of the ions on whether or not the compound dissolves in water. So you'll revisit this a little bit more in chapter 13, but here we just wanted to introduce the ion dipole force of attraction. It's actually a really strong attractive force. That's why our ionic compounds, some of them dissolve in water. Okay, so we can compare intermolecular forces between different types of substances. So if we have um, a noble gas, then the only attractive force that the atom can have, so like we're kind of comparing the attractive forces on things like helium versus things like CH4, CO2, uh, BF3, things that are nonpolar. We're then comparing molecules that are polar but can't H bond, like HCl, acetonitrile, et cetera. So we're looking at polar molecules next. We're then comparing things that hydrogen bond, like water, HF, et cetera. And then our ionic compounds dissolved in water, like NaCl, AQ, next. So we're kind of comparing what's the attractive force in helium. This table is a little confusing. I want to make sure we set the stage. We're kind of comparing for helium. It only has a dispersion force of attraction because it's not polar, doesn't have the dipole-dipole force, doesn't have H bonding forces, of course, doesn't have ion dipole forces. If we then look at a nonpolar molecule like CH4, CO2, BF2, or BF3, N2, O2, anything that's nonpolar, then we still only have the dispersion force. Um, and so then we don't have a dipole dipole force, no H bonding forces, no ion dipole forces. If we have a polar molecule like HCl, CH3CN, anything that's polar but not hydrogen bonding, meaning we don't have H directly attached to NO or F, then we only have the dispersion force and the dipole dipole force. But the key is that we still have the dispersion force too. That we don't lose or we don't not have the dispersion force because we have the dipole dipole force, we actually have both. And so, um, and then for polar molecules that can form hydrogen bondings, where we have um, an OH bond, an NH bond, or an HF bond, like water, NH3, HF, then we have all three of our key intermolecular forces, our dispersion force, dipole-dipole force, and then the hydrogen bonding force of attraction. And then for the ionic solid, I think this is a little confusing, that it shows it's still having dispersion forces, then it has the ion dipole force between the ion and water, I think we should be check marking here. I never understood why the book doesn't check mark these here. So like water still has dispersion forces, still has a dipole dipole force. I think this chart might be comparing just the ion with the water interaction, only maybe has the ion dipole force, but the water molecules in between the sphere of like one chlorine with this water and you have other waters in between, those other waters in between have the dipole dipole force and the hydrogen bonding force of attraction. So this sample, I think, still contains all four of these key um, intermolecular forces. Okay, so one of the keys is seeing that basically everything has dispersion forces. The, the question is, does it also have a dipole-dipole force which is stronger in addition to the dispersion force? Does it also have a hydrogen bonding force of attraction which is even stronger? Does it have an ion dipole force of attraction which is the strongest of all the four? So we have the strongest attractive force between ion and dipoles. So having like a full charge with a dipole is better than having two partially charged dipoles. And if you have hydrogen as being a member of the dipole, hydrogen being directly bonded to NORF, a really strong attractive force through that hydrogen bond. Okay, so let's compare some different molecules. So this is showing one propanol. Um, so one propanol has one hydrogen bond that can form between adjacent molecules. So one propanol is just like um, ethanol with an extra CH2 group, so it's the, so one propanol would be the hydroxyl group, then CH2, CH2, CH3. And then acetic acid has a comparable size, it's the same uh, molar mass, 
but the arrangement here is we have a CH3, C double bond O, and then the hydroxyl group here. And the difference here is that we form two hydrogen bonds. So having two hydrogen bond abilities within one molecule is better than one. This is the same example kind of between water versus HF. Two hydrogen bonds better than one. We have a higher boiling point as a result of having more hydrogen bonding ability. So the ability to hydrogen bond uh, for acetic acid is even stronger than it is in the alcohol of one propanol. This slide here is comparing the intermolecular forces present between different sized compounds in terms of structural differences, looking at um, um, having more atoms to distribute the same amount of charge, but then also comparing whether or not we have hydrogen bonding possible versus only the, disp the dispersion force. So the first two examples, let's look at radon versus xenon. So radon, the largest molar mass, 222 AMU versus radon, uh, 131. The melting point and boiling point of radon higher than that of xenon by quite a bit, but the boiling point's still minus 61 degrees C. So the boiling point's still quite a ways away from room temperature for radon, even though it's a really big atom, really high molar mass, um, still pretty low boiling point. Bromine, notice it has 160 AMU versus 130 AMU, a little bit bigger than xenon, quite a bit smaller than radon, but it has a much higher boiling point, much higher melting point than radon um, even has, and it's because having two atoms is better than one. So spreading the electrons out is better. Um, so if we can spread the electrons out even more, what about in the structure of dodecane? So dodecane is the, um, I think it's the C11. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. It's the C12 isomer, so it's the C12H26 molecule. And it's uh, uh, boiling point over 200 degrees C. So it's about the same size. It's a tiny bit bigger than bromine, but it has a lot higher of a boiling point because it now has even more atoms to spread out its charge. So more atoms for nonpolar molecules are better than fewer atoms with the same atomic weight. Then if we look at glucose, also pretty comparable in terms of molar mass, about 180 grams per mole, but we have all these hydrogen bonding sites. Look at all these hydrogen bond. We can form one, two, three, four, five hydrogen bonds per molecule. We also have a polar kind of oxygen in the middle here too. So we have polar molecule um, hydrogen bonds possible. The melting point here, you, let's compare the melting point. Minus 10 for dodecane, 150 degrees C for glucose. Glucose breaks down, ends up caramelizing, doesn't really boil like some molecules do. So some molecules will break down. Glucose just decomposes if we keep heating it past its melting point. But you can see it clearly has a lot higher of a melting point, a lot stronger intermolecular forces. So the strongest intermolecular forces happen when we have the strongest types of intermolecular forces possible, H bonds, compared to only the dispersion force. But dispersion forces can collectively be quite high. Only, you know, so dodecane only has a dispersion force and its boiling point's 200 degrees. You know, so we can still have relatively strong intermolecular forces with only the dispersion force. We just need a lot of size and a lot of atoms um, to distribute those electrons. Um, let's actually pick up with this question next time. So this question just gets into uh, boiling point trends with branching again, kind of comes back to a topic. So we'll pick up with this question at the start of class on Wednesday. That's it for today. Have a great day, guys.